Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we're going to talk about sustainable development, the rise of it, the strategies behind it, and the importance of it. Let's get started. We first need to talk about the problems. There are significant environmental costs associated with economic development. We'll start with the depletion of natural resources. Industrialization consumes natural resources, so as a result, they are subject to decline. This can include mining for fossil fuels and minerals, deforestation, soil erosion, depletion of water resources, and overfishing. For example, if farmers grow crops today, in ways that cause extensive soil erosion. Land that is fertile now will not be in the future, and food supplies will decrease. And without the discovery of new deposits or the development of new extraction techniques, our current consumption patterns are unsustainable, and that can negatively impact a country's economy and future productivity. In addition to the potential economic losses from resource depletion, it can displace indigenous peoples and lead to the loss of habitats for plant and animal life. The reality is that the wealthiest and most developed countries are also the largest consumers of these natural resources. As Rostow pointed out, several countries have reached the end stage of his model, a point of high mass consumption. So on a per person basis, a per capita basis, core countries consume the most fossil fuels, beef, and other resources that can take a significant environmental toll on our planet. The burning of fossil fuels for industry, the use of personal automobiles or jet travel, as well as current agricultural practices are leading to increasing levels of pollution. Pollution comes in several different forms. So be sure if you see this on an FRQ, make sure you specify if you're referring to air, water, or soil pollution. Pollution is when the air, water, or earth become contaminated to the point that normal functions are negatively affected. Factories, chemical plants, automobiles, and agricultural runoff generate significant pollution. Factories and automobiles contribute to air pollution, while chemicals used in agriculture can contaminate both soil and water, as we'll explore in future lectures. And some of the cities with the world's worst air quality include Beijing, China, Jakarta in Indonesia, and New Delhi in India. All countries and cities that have recently industrialized and are undergoing rapid economic growth. And the final problem that we need to discuss is certainly the biggest, climate change. Climate change refers to the long-term change in temperature and weather patterns. The Earth goes through normal cycles of climate change, but since the Industrial Revolution, human activities have increasingly influenced that change. The combustion of fossil fuels have been the top human-created source of carbon dioxide, commonly called CO2, in Earth's atmosphere. The CO2 molecule traps heat so there is a strong relationship between the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the average global temperature, which has been increasing. The warming of the planet is driving climate change and also producing other negative effects, such as rising sea levels and more extreme weather events. So how do we address these challenges? Conventional development favors economic and social gains but gives scant attention to the impact of these gains on resource use, consumption, or the state of the environment. Sustainable development is development providing for the needs of the present generation 
without diminishing the options of future generations. So a sustainable environment is defined as one that would last indefinitely, providing adequate resources for the world's population. But how do we do that? You've probably already heard some of the strategies like reduce, reuse, recycle. If we can reduce the amount of natural resources we consume by implementing more efficient methods, that will preserve resources for future generations. Some farmers are implementing practices that decrease the amount of water used for irrigation, which can also reduce runoff and the potential for pollution in bodies of water. The United States set standards for factory and vehicle emissions in the Clean Air Act of 1963. And the U.S. also promoted reusing resources like water through the creation of wastewater treatment plants in the Clean Water Act of 1972. A global focus has been on a shift toward renewable energy resources and away from non-renewable resources. In 2005, about 43 countries had goals of switching a certain portion of their energy consumption to renewable resources. By 2017, that number of countries had escalated to 164 across all regions of our planet. Globally, renewable resources now account for more than two thirds of all new power sources. Sweden reached its 2020 target of 50% renewable energy in 2012 and are now aiming for 100% renewable energy by 2040. Denmark gets 70% of its energy from wind and solar. Australia has over 20% of its energy coming from renewables. Ireland, Germany, and Spain do as well. The United States has seen renewable energy consumption nearly quadruple since 1950, but it still accounts for about 11% of our country's total energy consumption. But there are other sustainable strategies we should mention as well. Reducing CO2 emissions is another area that many countries and their political subdivisions, as well as individual corporations and people, have focused on. Reducing emissions is also paired with carbon removal. Because plants take in CO2 through their leaves, increasing forest cover through reforestation, like Africa's Great Green Wall, and forest conservation is a way to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. But the burden of sustainability is not equitable. Peripheral countries involved in resource extraction are often more greatly impacted by the negative environmental effects and social inequalities, while core countries can better afford to undertake conservation efforts and human rights protections. A so-called debt for nature swap has been utilized to provide investment in developing areas in exchange for environmental protection and conservation. But a new strategy has emerged in many periphery and semi-periphery countries. It is called ecotourism. Ecotourism is a form of tourism based on enjoyment of natural areas that minimizes the impact to the environment and supports conservation efforts. So ecotourism is a responsible form of travel that does not harm ecosystems or the well-being of local people, but instead considers the health and welfare of the community as one of its main goals. Examples include protected rainforests in Costa Rica, Brazil, Peru, and Borneo, nature preserves in Botswana, Tanzania, and Ecuador, mountain hiking in Nepal, visiting coral reefs in Australia, seeing glaciers in Alaska or fjords in Norway. There are so many different examples of ecotourism, but how does it promote sustainability? Typically, these sites will charge a fee to fund the maintenance and preservation of natural landscapes. In fact, 
Revenue from ecotourism is rescuing Uganda's mountain gorillas from extinction. And it can help to reduce poverty. For example, protected areas in Costa Rica have helped reduce poverty by up to two-thirds in surrounding communities. And since governments realize that these tropical rainforests and coastal marine ecosystems can bring sustained economic growth if they're protected rather than exploited, they have begun limiting other commercial activities in these areas. Costa Rica has protected 25% of its entire land area in the form of national parks and other protected areas. In addition, ecotourism operations typically have an educational component, so tourists can learn about indigenous cultures, the history of the area, and local issues. But a focus on ecotourism still must be managed, because as national parks attract additional tourist revenue, this may also attract multinational corporations whose income flows out of the country leaving little revenue for local inhabitants. And there may be negative environmental impacts despite the best efforts to preserve natural landscapes. Plants may be trampled and the behavior of the wildlife may change as well. Combine that with the infrastructure that must be developed to accommodate the increased tourist traffic. Countries may need to build airports, cruise ports, roads, and telecommunication systems. This also invites more vehicles, which can generate pollution. Our final discussion point on sustainable development is a set of goals that were created by the United Nations. In 2015, the United Nations rolled out the Sustainable Development Goals, commonly just called the SDGs. The goals are multifaceted, aiming to end poverty, protect the environment, and reduce inequalities among countries by 2030. And the underlying idea is that all of these goals will promote a more sustainable future for all. Some of the goals are obvious. Climate action and affordable clean energy are obviously there to support sustainability. But what about good health and well-being? How does that support sustainability? Well, by lowering infant mortality rates, fewer babies will be born, leading to slower natural increase rates and lower overall population. Lower population growth potentially means fewer people to emit carbon and consume resources. The point here being that each of these goals ultimately aims to deal with sustainability. Countries like India, Chile and the Philippines, among many others, have implemented specific policies aimed at achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. But the United Nations monitors each country's progress during an annual review of all 193 member states and their performance on the SDGs. In 2019, Denmark ranked at the top with a score of 85. That means that Denmark is 85% of the way toward meeting the 2030 targets for all 17 SDGs. Sweden and Finland were also near the top. The Central African Republic ranked last with a score of 39, again meaning that they're less than 40% of the way towards meeting the goals. Chad and the Democratic Republic of the Congo were also near the bottom. But regardless of individual countries' performances, several goals are considered alarming or moving in the wrong direction. Specifically, Goal 13, Climate Action, and goals dealing with biodiversity conservation, like Goals 14 and 15, are of particular concern. But we're going to continue this conversation and go into more depth and detail when I see you back in class. Have a good evening, everyone.